খুব এসালাইচার জন্য সো তিনি জনয়ে অনলাইন আর কেস কানি ব্রহ্মা তোমে পিরোশি ইন ইন্ট্রোডাকশন ক্লাসিফিকেশন পটু ফিজিওলজি সাইন্স এন্ড সিমটম নিউ ডিসকাস লোমে বিন ডায়াগনোসিস কো ব্লু লোবলে সোরা শিন জামে বিন ট্রিটমেন্ট জাম পিও পিয়া মা বোনো পিরোশি লং টাইম অফ অফ দ্য পিই এন এন ক্যান অ্যানসার অফ দ্য কেসেস কো লে সুইনি তোমা পিয়া পারে আকু প্রেজেন্টেশন মাসা গে আকু কেসেস দেও পিয়া পারে এ কেসেস দেও গো আ উ গানি পিরো মা লাই পিরো মা ঠি থাবি পা দি প্রেজেন্টেশন পি দরে খাজা লুছি নো দি এ অ্যানসার দেবো শিমিয়া পে দমা পে পারে আচ্ছা এই লেজা গা সকা নাও পে পামে কেস কো কো হাবো ওকে আলো মে কেস দেও লাইক মত ওয়ান নাই মে লু থে মারে সো আম উই আর গোইং টু স্টার্ট দা প্রেজেন্টেশনস নাও সো লেট আস স্টার্ট উইথ ইন্ট্রোডাকশনস ওকে হোয়াট ইজ পালমোনারি এমবোলিজমস সো এন্ড পালমোনারি এমবোলিজমস ইট মিনস দ্যাট অবস্ট্রাকশনস অফ দ্য পালমোনারি আর্টারি বাই এনি ম্যাটেরিয়ালস সো বি ইট দ্য থ্রম্বাস দ্য টিউমার এর অর দ্য ফ্যাট ইট ক্যান বি প্রেজেন্টেড ফ্রম এনি পার্ট অফ দ্য বডি এন্ড অবস্ট্রাকটেড at the pulmonary artery so today topic is going to be focused on the pulmonary embolism due to the thrombus all right so pulmonary embolism in fact is quite common and it can cause a quite huge impact on um, the populations it's just behind the um, cardiovascular syndromes like myocardial infarction and stroke and it can occur in one to two per thousand each years, half of the million events in the United States annually. In a longitudinal observational study reveals that there is the increasing of the events of the pulmonary embolisms over the times. Maybe it may be because of the high pickup um, due to the advanced investigations nowadays. The incidence, is also increased with the age from uh, one is to one ten thousands um, when the patient is younger it can um, go up to a uh, hundred times more when the patient is more than 80 years old or older so when we talk about pulmonary embolisms right the increasing sensitivity of the image uh, make is make it 
easier to detect nowadays. However, uh, the cases fatality rate uh, still remain the same. Um, and embolizations from the deep vein thrombosis still um, still the most common cause of the uh, pulmonary embolisms um, at, uh, until to date, all right? Um, registry studies have found that nearly 20% of the patients die within three months of the diagnosis after the venous thromboembolisms or PE. Although there may be a cases um, the death may be due to the previous comorbidities rather than the right uh, impact of the pulmonary embolisms. In the recent uh, large randomized control study, the treatment all mortality causes has been approximately about 2%, which is a little bit high um, cause, um, even though we have uh, detected pulmonary embolisms relatively higher nowadays. So 50, half of the cases um, associated with the transient risk factor, as I mentioned in this box, um, is a busy table, but um, you can uh, look into what are the strong risk factor, moderate risk factor, and then weak risk factors. Nearly one fifth of the cases are associated with the cancer, then the reminder may or may not even have associations, which we call it and provoke. Bear in mind that um, in a European uh, society guideline in 2019, they don't really use um, and provoke or provoke anymore, rather than they are using a high risk or transient risk factors. Uh, but to me, I still find it that using provoke or and provoke makes um, your clinical judgment or, or in terms of the management uh, helpful, all right? For the classifications, you can either classify into the the timing of the symptoms. You can divide it into acute, subacute, and chronic based on the symptoms occur after the pulmonary embolisms occur, all right? In a chronic, um, it developed into the chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, which the patients may present with the long-term symptoms. And sometimes we detect those kind of patients in echocardiogram. For me, rather, I prefer these classifications because it, it has a clinical impact on how you define it, will um, make arrangement of your management. So in a massive or high-risk PE, the patients will be hemodynamically and stable, which means that patients' systolic blood pressures will be lower than 90, or a drop in more than a 40 millimeter mercury from the baseline for the period of more than 15 minutes, which is rather short period. And a hypotension, which require all these vasoactive agents. And of course, it doesn't cause, it was not caused by any other causes apart from pulmonary embolism. For the submassive intermediate risk PE, you may be able to identify right ventricular strain without affecting your uh, vitals, okay? For the root risk PE, there is no evidence of the right ventricular strain. And of course, the patient's vital will be stable, all right? So pathogenesis of the PE is similar to the, uh, the generations of the thrombus. We all know that Vachau's triad includes of the hypercoagulability, vascular damage, and circulatory stasis, which in terms cause the thrombus and travel through the pulmonary artery and obstruct, and then make the patients having symptoms or the signs. For the source, as I mentioned before, most emboli are from lower extremities, mainly from the porosomal veins. More than half of the patients who has a PE also have the proximal vein, deep vein thrombosis. One third of the cut vein from a um, uh, 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 distal deep vein thrombosis still can extend it to the proximal vein and can cause the pulmonary PE. Although I mentioned it here, usually the distal isolated cut vein can 
um, uh, disappear uh, spontaneously. So what are the determinants of the outcomes? The right ventricular failure is the most important um, determinants outcome for the PE. It is due to the acute pressure overload and cause the, the mortality and the patient's death. It started with vasoconstriction because of the chemical release from the PE causing pulmonary vascular resistance to be on a high pressure. It in turn caused the pressures back to the right ventricle and it will expand the right ventricular volume causing the wall tensions and myocyte stretch. Because of the, the wall tensions and myocyte stretch, right? It will cause the contractions time of the right ventricles and it will in turn impact on the septum, which will cause the leftward bowing of the interventricular septums and desynchronize the ventricles. So overall will impact on the light, left ventricle filling and it will cause the cardiac output to be dropped and which result the systemic hypotension and hemodynamically instability. So this is the short diagram that I uh, have presented for the last few slides. So increasing right ventricular afterload will cause all the way to reduce the cardiac output and eventually death. So another factor is infarctions because the pulmonary emboli will impact it on the segment or distally to the set segment of the pulmonary artery will cause the pulmonary to be infarct. So it will present with the parotid chest pain or hemoptysis in this kind of uh, presentations. Another signs and symptoms that we uh, note that is abdominal gas exchange causing mainly hypoxemia. It is due to because of the mechanical and functional obstructions of the vascular bed and um, it will altering the vent VQ ratios known as ventilations to perfusion ratios. It also causes inflammations because of the obstructions and direct impact to the surface tent uh, causing dysfunctions and atelectasis and further impair the functional of the pulmonary system. So what are the clinical signs and symptoms of the PE? So here, I will mention it um, in a down sequence of the um, uh, common presentations. First of all, you will see that patients will have a dyspnea, at rest or with the exertions which most of the patients will have these symptoms. The parotid chest pain can be present in more than half of the patients. Calf pain or thigh pain can be present. As I mentioned before, 50% of the patients will have a simultaneous deep vein thrombosis at the time of the presentations. Patients may present them with a cough or orthopnea in some of the cases. Rarely, they may present it with a wheezing or hemoptysis. And less commonly can present with the uh, arrhythmia, principopy, syncope, or even in a collapse cases. What are the common presentation signs that we can detect in the PE? Of course, patients will have a tachypnea. There will be a swelling of the cuff or the tie, okay? They may have a tachycardia, and sometimes may even have a real or decreased breath sound. Some patients, you may even can detect the accentuated pulmonary component of the second heart sound, which we call it log P2 in the pulmonary area. There will be a jugular venous uh, distensions, but uh, I assume that most of the, the uh, clinicians or physicians uh, will not have time to uh, examine uh, the, the JVP in a very acute or hemodynamically unstable cases. They may even present it with a fever and um, it may mimicking a pneumonia presentations. 
even though the study showed that this is only 3%, on and off in a hospital setting, we diagnose the patients with the fever and tachycardia um, uh, uh, presentations. Of course, sometimes in the middle of the night, you may get a call for the collapse due to the PE, which is about 8%. So diagnosis of the PE, this is quite a big wide um, discussion that um, people have been talking about how to diagnose, uh, how we can improve on. So let's talk about diagnosis of PE to increase the actual um, um, diagnosis of the PE. You need a few factors uh, to have in your mind, all right? First of all, of course, symptoms and signs should um, uh, uh, should focus or direct it to the PE. So you may have some suspicions from the beginning, whether this is PE or not. And secondly, you have to have a, a cautious mind to look for the predisposing factors of the venous thromboembolisms, all right? Uh, especially those um, long-term stayer in a hospital or those recently have a operations or the patients with the cancer history. The last but not the least, you need to think about the pretest probability, how high risk the patients will have um, of the PE, all right? So when you have this uh, kind of thought, then it will make you to do a second step which is the scoring system. So Wells criterion for PE is a well-known and a, a commonly used uh, criteria for diagnosis of the PE. You can easily use your smartphone uh, using um, uh, uh, advanced uh, applications nowadays. Um, this is from Mac Health. All right, if you don't have it, I will suggest you to download it because it's very useful um, in a day-to-day -day practice, all right? So um, you uh, can have a score interpretations. Um, nowadays, uh, even though uh, uh, in an exam, they may ask for the scoring, um, scoring system and all that, but day to day, you can still use the applications to save your patients, all right? So it can uh, differentiate into the low, moderate and high. The another and commonly used is the revi revised Geneva rule. So here in the table, I, um, uh, I took a snapshot you know, from the ESC. They have a show it from the original and then simplified versions. For the scoring, they have a three level score or the two level score um, here uh, that you can um, see here, all right? So it will identify whether the patients have a low, intermediate or high risk of the PE. So this is a comparison of uh, um, the scoring system that I mentioned, um, uh, which is a, a, a concise table uh, for the criteria. all right. So here comes another scoring, which is to rule out the pulmonary embolisms, which is called pulmonary embolism rule out criteria, PERC. Um, it is mainly to uh, uh, use in the patients with a very low clinical probability of the PE to uh, avoid unnecessary testing for the patients. All right. In a low probability, in a low probability of the pulmonary embolisms um, uh, criteria, you have to put in on this uh, PRC score, and um, if the patients fulfill all the criteria that I mentioned here, the eight criteria, you don't really need to go any further investigations anymore. It was mentioned in a bit studies of um, uh, PARCB, which is the Mardi Center, a prospective observational, and then um, also mentioned in a, a one uh, proper randomized uh, clinical trial. This is uh, mainly to save when you have the limitations of the investigations or resource, yeah. But bear in mind that this criteria should be only applied to low probability pulmonary embolism scoring group, all right? So let's move on to the uh, usual uh, laboratory test that we need to send out, right? 
of course, patients should uh, be tested for the full blood count and then um, at least renal panel for the serum chemistry to uh, further re-evaluate that whether patients can go for any uh, contract scan or not. Um, if you have a facility, you should do a arterial blood gas, especially when the patients have a hypoxemia. You can do a BNB troponin for the scoring, which I will uh, uh, mention later, all right? So D-dimer, of course, when you fit into the uh, criteria, when you want to rule out the patients uh, of the pulmonary embolism, you should do a D-dimer. And then, of course, you should do a baseline ECG and the chest X-ray. This is a very typical features of the pulmonary embolism ECGs. Here you can see that um, there is a uh, S1, Q3, T3 um, um, signs, which is relatively rare. And then also note that there is a right bender branch block, which you can see there is a tall R with an M kind of uh, shape in a V1 and V2. Surprisingly, in this ECG, um, you don't see uh, sinus tachycardia. Most of the patients well presented with the tachycardia in the ECG plus minus with the keyway inversions most of the time. For the chest X-ray, you can diagnose the PE, although this is very, very rare. For myself, I have not seen the, um, uh, this, these signs. Um, I have uh, uh, studied the literatures and, um, uh, and note that there is the uh, Hampton's harm, which you can diagnose in a, a pulmonary embolism. Uh, in, in my uh, um, experience uh, during all these uh, practicing years, I only have seen the wet shake um, hypoolimate signs or wet shake uh, infections um, on the chest X ray. All right. But um, just to share uh, the knowledge with um, all the audience, I um, have downloaded this uh, chest X ray. All right. For the uh, sharing. So this is another um, a size of the Hampton's hump, which is like a shallow hump shape opacity, mainly in the peripheral of the lungs, all right? So now we go on to the D-dimer testing, all right? Yes, we all know that uh, D-dimer has a very high sensitivity, roughly about more than 95%, but only when you use the ELISA-derived assay, it means that high sensitivity doesn't really um, interpret into a specificity. D-dimer is not specific at all. It can be presented in many inflammations or inflammatory causes. So in the D-dimer testing, every um, uh, uh, hospital or, or even in the countries, uh, they use a different kind of uh, uh, assay and method. Usually the cutoff is uh, 500 uh, nano uh, microgram, um, but now more and more um, uh, evidence have seen that if the patient is more than 50 years old, you should even adjust the D-dimer uh, result by multiplying with 10, uh, uh, I mean 10 microgram per liter to the H. All right, um, using the H adjusted uh, will. Um, will prevent unnecessary testing in this group without any additional false negative findings. However, this is also a class 2A or B evidence, which means that it gives you a, like uh, considerations. And then um, this uh, conclusion is made from the single RCT or large non-randomized um, uh, control trial. So whether should we use the higher cutoff when the patient's um, probability is uh, low or not. Also, um, there is a, some study have uh, mentioned that when the patients have a uh, low probability with D-dimer not raising very high, um, uh, should, uh, should be able to rule out um, the PE. Uh, but um, this is also another, not a very strong suggestion um, and it, it means that um, it's about the class 2A uh, uh, evidence in uh, ESC. 
So um, another thing that we uh, commonly use uh, mainly in um, uh, private clinic settings, which they use a point of care D-dimer assay, um, is this a lower sensitivity and it can have a higher negative predictive value. So um, we need to uh, have a sense that where this D-dimer has been tested, all right? And uh, what kind of test that the patient's um, uh, was taken. After the D-dimer, of course, um, we move on to the CT pulmonary angiogram. Usually when we um, order the pulmonary uh, uh, angiography, uh, it's because patients have um, intermediate or high risk of the PE. We don't really do D-dimer and then uh, CTPA altogether. However, I have to um, admit that in a um, uh, AA department, whenever um, they take the blood, they will just take the D-dimer when they are uh, suspicious of the PE. Um, but I think it, it will depend on country to country when the results um, is um, not really uh, limited, all right? So this is the method of the choice at this moment. It can um, visualize the pulmonary artery through the sub segment level. It has the very thinnest cut, all right? It can see a very good optimal image quality if the patients can uh, uh, lie still, all right? And uh, also can hold the breath. But most of the patients may have a, a breathlessness. So it's a little bit difficult, but uh, most of the time, uh, CDPA should be able to uh, detect the PE. Uh, all right. Um, of course, uh, as I mentioned that why we do uh, at least a renal panel or renal function test is because uh, CDPA has the contrast, which can have affect your uh, the patient's uh, kidney uh, functions further um, if they have a previous uh, kidney disease. So uh, it is relatively contraindicated uh, when the, uh, the kidney disease is about stage uh, four or five. But when the patients have the dialysis, of course, you can go ahead with that and then uh, you can order dialysis the next day, right? So here uh, you can see that the ambulance um, sitting on the left pulmonary tract. Okay, so this is LCD findings of the pulmonary embolisms. And here I want to show you the right ventriculars and left ventriculars. You can see that the right ventricular is roughly almost the same or even bigger than the uh, left ventricles. We show that this is a right ventricular strain, okay? And then the septum deviations that you can see is left inward, okay? So this patient is at least um, submassive PE, or if there is a hemodynamically unstable, it will be massive PE. Now move on to the VQ scan. Um, we don't really do a VQ scan um, nowadays because uh, CDP is, is very uh, readily available, um, especially in a developer country. Um, we can just order in the CTPA, but but um, there are the uh, the the, uh, the the incident that you can think of the VQ scan when the CTPA is contraindicated for some reason when the patients have a, like contrast allergy or something uh, uh, to do with the kidney functions, you can think of the VQ scan. Uh, of course, you need a, at least a normal chest X-ray uh, prior to the VQ scan to compare and contrast or um, have interpretations after the VQ scan. The patients may have to lie about 30 to 60 minutes in the VQ scan. So it's rather long when the patients have um, uh, uh, acute PE, with the uh, uh, acute uh, symptoms. Um, you, can, uh, uh, you can report uh, uh, with the pretest uh, assessment and the VQ scan all together. So the pretest assessment is actually is also quite important in the VQ scan. Um, it can um, apply into the pregnant woman all right, um, but later I will mention it, uh, also in a, a summary table that um, in fact, there is um, uh, recommendations of the CDPA in the pregnancy as well. This is the example of the VQ scan being done. 
um, on our uh, on our left side. Uh, this is the perfusion scan, and then this is a ventilation scan. You can see that the perfusion scan there is uh, some disminished um, image on the left lower uh, lobe. In fact, these patients have uh, like multi uh, segment uh, affected. But uh, when you look at the ventilations, actually, in fact, the ventilation is about the same. Um, apparently, it's showing a VQ mismatch. So with the pretest um, probability, these patients have the PE. Right. Of course, when the patients have uh, a pneumonia, then then um, your interpretations interpretations of the uh, VQ scan may be affected as well. So the pretest assessment, uh, the normal chest X-ray, um, always play uh, some big role in uh, uh, interpretation of the VQ scan. So this is a summary um, table of the the imaging that you can do. Um, just uh, mainly look at into the CTPA and the VQ scan. Um, there are a lot of strand, um, of course, um, in a CTPA. Uh, nowadays, uh, you can just do it in a very short time span. Readily can be done in an A&E when we have a very high suspicions of PE. The only thing is that the radiation exposures, but I would say that it's quite worth it um, when you compare to the radiation exposures and um, um, uh, to diagnose the PE because it can affect the, uh, the, the life, right? Um, of course, VQ scan, if the patients have uh, um, uh, chronic kidney disease that cannot go for a CTPA that you can use for it. There are some um, uh, discussions between the hematologists and then, um, uh, uh, chest physicians that um, in pregnancies, uh, they should use the VQ scan or CTPA, but still there are some debate going on, all right? Then there are others imaging um, investigation that you can do for PE, in fact, pulmonary angiogram, which will be very invasive, of course, it would be the, um, the most accurate uh, investigation that you can do, which is you inject the dye and look into the pulmonary angiogram uh, through, through um, percutaneous um, intravascular approach, all right? Um, but really, uh, um, people do it nowadays anymore. Um, you can order a magnetic uh, resonant angiography, which will be time consuming. Usually, uh, the results will be limited for the MI scan, all right, when you have a CTPA uh, uh, can be done, um, people will not think of the MRI scan anymore. Echo echocardiography, um, which um, is very, very useful investigation that you can uh, diagnose the PE, um, so be it to the diagnosis or so be it to, for the severity, all right? You can e even uh, perform a bedside echo, uh, which um, is uh, quite easy. And then um, if you know, all right, you can see the, um, the right ventricular strain, septic deviations um, from the echocardiogram, all right? Of course, um, if patients cannot go for any of the scan at the moment, and then you, you want to avoid all the radiation risks and all that, of course, uh, you can just screen the um, deep vein thrombosis of the lower extremities by doing a compression ultrasound graph. Um, so this is the um, images of the uh, right ventricular uh, strain, how you look at it. This is the um, parasternal long axis view. Um, in, in that view, you can see the right ventricular will be uh, bigger, all right, um, when you're using the echo um, uh, in a cardio uh, window, all right. Then um, usually I will use the long axis and I will move on to the four chamber view from, um, pointing from the apical, which you can uh, compare and contrast uh, between the right ventricular and left ventricular volume and movement of the septum. Although sometimes uh, we will look at the short exit view because um, you can just turn your long exit to the 90 degree, you can um, uh, sort of like a, you can detect the right ventricular uh, quite easily as well. All right. This is a very useful um, uh, algorithm of how we should investigate um, the PE. All right. So if there is a low pretest probability, we can go ahead with the PRC rule. If there is no point, you can um, 
rule of the PE. Of course, if there is a, some points on, uh, pointing towards, then you can do a D-dimer. Bear in mind that when you have the uh, low probability, you can straight away do a D-dimer if you are uh, being cautious and you have a resource, all right? Um, and if you have done a D-dimer and it become positive, of course, you only left with the option A or B to um, diagnose definitely um, uh, um, by doing a CDPA or VQ scan, okay? So um, as I mentioned here, um, in a pregnancy patients, the diagnosis imaging choices are about similar um, as uh, non-pregnant uh, patients, okay? Um, they are still debating which one is better, but um, both scans are, are quite accurate and safe um, according to the studies. Um, there is uh, some algorithm that they have uh, uh, produced uh, called YEARS algorithm um, uh, based on the, some study, but um, usually uh, it's all the same as a non-pregnant uh, uh, patients. The algorithm is here. They only mention about um, uh, years criteria, whether there is a one, two, or three um, signs here. And then um, usually they will just go and scan the uh, lower extremities, whether the patients have a deep vein thrombosis or not. Based on that, um, they will uh, put the patients on higher probability uh, uh, and um, they will go ahead with the further scanning. So when you have a pulmonary embolism, you may also think about, should I do a thrombophilia uh, testing for the patients? Okay, um, still controversy, okay? Considerable controversy remains around um, because it does not alter your management, okay? At the point of the time. And um, if the thrombolia testing is used, it should be done only after you complete the treatment for the acute event or in the absence of the anticoagulation therapy, because there are a lot of false positive tests can um, uh, happen when you're using the anticoagulations. All right. And the one only incidence of um, uh, disease that you can think of is antiphospholipid syndrome. In that case, you should do um, antiphospholipid uh, uh, screening at the later end, okay? Um, if you haven't given the anticoagulations from the start, you can uh, check antiphospholipid syndrome, send it off your lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipine IgG, IgM, and um, nowadays you can even do the beta glycoprotein IgG, IgM. You should um, uh, screen for antiphospholipid syndrome at the later end, if you cannot find any transient factors um, related to the PE, because antiphospholipid syndrome is one of the things can cause the venous thromboembolisms and also arterial thromboembolisms. Okay, now we move on to the treatment of the PE. So start of the treatment, we need to think about whether this patient should be treated in patients or outpatients, okay? Here comes another criteria again, okay? This is to assess the severity of the PE. This is only used after you have diagnosis with the PE. This assessment um, uh, will predict the 30-day uh, mortality uh, outcome of the patients, okay? Um, but if you have uh, more than one point, the mortality rate is high. So. If the patients have any point positive, you just admit the patients and monitor in patients, all right? So there is a simplified versions. I usually use the simplified versions uh, for my patients, okay? So after you have um, put the patients on the, uh, uh, the ward, uh, you need to think about where are you going to put, uh, uh, admit the patients, all right? So you need to think about hemodynamic and then respiratory support, all right? First of all, you start oxygen therapy for the comfort or oxygen supplement, okay? 
just that whatever you have it, uh, Nisaprong face mask uh, uh, to maintain the situations well, okay? And it increases accordingly, all right? Some patients uh, will be uh, provided high flow oxygen um, in, in some cases, all right? In the worst case scenario, patients will be even intubated, uh, will be uh, directly admitted to the um, uh, intensive care unit, all right? Um, but you need to think about uh, rather not to increase the uh, intrathoracic pressures, which will also cause the hemodynamically impact um, if you're using a very high pressures uh, with the mechanical ventilations. So for pharmacological treatment of the acute uh, right ventricle failure, you can um, uh, start with um, uh, giving fluid. Um, you should use the crystalline uh, fluids uh, based on many, many studies have uh, uh, mentioned before. Uh, you can either use a normal saline or Hartmann ringer lactate. Um, some studies have uh, mentioned that do not overload the patients because um, when you overload the uh, pre, uh, right ventricular, which will in terms will have more right ventricular stretch, all right, and then will have a more impact on the um, uh, left ventricle and causing the drop of the cardiac output. If you really cannot um, maintain the MAP above 65 or, or systolic blood pressure so above 90, you should start thinking of using vasoactive agent. Preferably use the no adrenaline, which um, can increase the uh, contractions of the uh, myocardium, also can increase the uh, vascular resistance, all right? If you use uh, dobutamine, bear in mind that it can cause the uh, drop in uh, uh, arterial blood pressures uh, because of the uh, uh, full symptomatic uh, actions. So you should um, use together with a uh, vasopressor. Um, in a very um, high advanced um, or tertiary hospital, you can even think about using ECMO, uh, extracorporeal um, oxygenation machines to support the patients. So what medication that we can use um, to uh, uh, treat? Um, and um, now we move on to the um, life support. Um, sorry about the heading, I think the heading is wrong. So if the patients collapse after confirmation of the PE, please provide the uh, advanced um, uh, uh, life support with the treatment for the past less uh, electric activities, which will include your or CPR and adrenaline, all right? And then read the rhythm accordingly. You can um, also um, provide it with the uh, mechanical ventilation and oxygenation, which I mentioned before, but rarely um, patients will need uh, ECMO uh, most of the time. Uh, I haven't seen the patients need an ECMO because of the PE, because most of um, the cases here um, uh, uh, receive um, other reperfusion um, uh, treatment before the patients are uh, totally, uh, you know, uh, going down south. So anticoagulations, what anticoagulation we can use? Um, of course, uh, we can start up with um, uh, uh, anticoagulations. If you have a high probability uh, while waiting for the scan or while waiting for the uh, uh, admission to the ward, all right, you can start up with the low molecular weight heparin or the infraction heparin. Um, usually, uh, if the patient is not very stable, I tend to use the infraction um, heparin because um, uh, we can stop it at any time. Um, and it is, it, it, if the patients need uh, some invasive um, form of the uh, reperfusion therapy, all right, when the patients have a renal impairment, um, I want to make sure that patients have a, a good uh, therapeutic threshold. Or when the patient is uh, severely uh, obese, um, rather than um, making uh, or calculations of the low molecular weight heparin, I would just use the infraction uh, heparin. Of course, the downside is you have to check the 
uh, your co coagulopathy, um, and then you have to make sure that your APTDPD is uh, in a therapeutic range. All right. So, will you use the warfarin um, in a, a PE? Yes, you can use the warfarin, uh, but you have to use together with the heparin uh, at least five days. And for the long term, yes, you can uh, go ahead with the uh, warfarin. Okay. Um, but um, because uh, um, the, the, the warfarin can cause um, the, some vitamin K dependent um, uh, anti thrombus uh, activities to be dropped like protein C and protein S, okay? Which also can cause you a uh, more protonbetic uh, effect if um, patients was not given together with the heparin. Um, you can nowadays uh, use um, this uh, direct oral anticoagulations, all right? There are many more uh, studies coming up uh, to uh, support the um, using of the newer agent, okay? And then you can use as the outpatients if your patient is uh, readily stable and then uh, um, Pepsi score is zero, uh, you can start it with um, this uh, Dorite uh, oral anticoagulations. Of course, um, the availability and the price will be the issues here. So um, this is a summary that uh, which medications uh, can be used uh, based on the, uh, the, dura the onset of the durations. So now move on to the reperfusion treatment, okay? For the reperfusion treatment, usually we reserve for the um, massive PE or uh, some sub-massive PE um, with the impending doom, all right? Um, for the systemic thrombolysis, there are multiple analysis has been done um, and um, it included uh, most of the cryogenic shock with the uh, um, Reductions of the combined of the mortality rate and a recurrent PE um, in this uh, group of the patients. So not bad. Um, if the patients have the high risk PE, uh, we should think about uh, systemic thromboembolisms. Um, but there is uh, 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 some percentage that patients will have a severe bleeding and then uh, roughly about 2% of the intracranial hemorrhage. So you need to monitor uh, patients very closely when you study the systemic thromboembolisms. Will you use the um, uh, intermediate risk PE, which we call submissive PE? Yes, and in some cases they also uh, have tried, but um, uh, they know that there is an increased uh, risk of the bleeding. So, um, I would say if the patients can type through uh, in the initial phase, even though there is a right ventricle um, uh, strain, uh, if there is no effect on the uh, blood pressures, we can uh, still go ahead with the anticoagulations. So um, you can use the uh, RTPA, all right, uh, which is a preferred method of uh, preferred drugs um, for the thrombolysis. It can be used um, roughly about uh, within uh, two weeks uh, if the patient is still unstable, okay? Um, there is not much of the study that uh, whether you give early or late will have uh, uh, any uh, long-term benefit or the symptoms. So this is the um, summary of the anti, um, uh, I mean, uh, thrombolytic agents that you can use. And then um, it also summarized the contraindications. All right. So another um, reperfusion uh, treatment would be percutaneous catheter director treatment. Um, it will require uh, experienced um, uh, intervention uh, radiologist to do that. There are many types of the catheter that you can use. Usually how they do is that they will go with the uh, femoral vein approach and then go um, through the, uh, the thrombus area and then um, they can uh, even give uh, urokinase, which is also uh, another thrombolysis agent, or they can use uh, some mechanical um, thrombolysis. But usually, um, even the experienced intervention radiologist will want the uh, cardiothoracic uh, to be stemmed by, all right? In case that the patients um, are collapse on, on the table, uh, then uh, they can uh, do an open uh, thrombectomy. 
So now uh, we move on to the another uh, reperfusion therapy, which is the surgical embolectomy. It can be used um, in a high-risk PE, okay? Uh, bear in mind that uh, we only provide it to the high-risk PE for the um, uh, surgical embolectomy, all right? Um, with or without cardiac arrest, uh, we can still perform it um, if, uh, you know, multidisciplinary team is um, uh, agreeable um, to go ahead with the uh, surgical uh, therapy, all right? Of course, a multidisciplinary team um, is, is essential uh, treating uh, acute PE, um, especially if the hospital or the care center um, uh, is, is well equipped. Uh, the multidisciplinary team, including you know, uh, vascular medicine, cardiothoracic, or the uh, critical care uh, physicians should all um, discuss together uh, for the um, uh, more uh, aggressive treatment. Um, even for the uh, secondary ho uh, hospital, they should have uh, some contact with uh, this uh, pulmonary embolism uh, multidisciplinary team would be better so that the patients can be timely transferred to the, the center that can provide uh, advanced care, all right? So uh, this is something to think about it uh, in the future um, if the survey is not set up yet. So let's say if you cannot give any kind of the treatment uh, because of the uh, contraindications of the patients, like uh, having, um, having a, a bleeding actively, or uh, maybe because a patient is old, frail, cannot go for the procedure, you can think of a, a vena cava filter. Um, it does not really treat the PEE, However, it can um, uh, minimize the, um, the thromboembolism from the lower, um, uh, lower extremities. Um, so most of the time, uh, they put it uh, for the temporary use. Um, when they are waiting for the uh, definite anticoagulation uh, treatment to be given, in those cases uh, who just went for the surgical treatment uh, and then uh, afraid of bleeding, or uh, the patients have uh, some septic shock uh, with the uh, DIVC, um, concomitant PE, then they may think about using the, the filter first. And after that, they will take it out um, in a few months time, uh, usually it's uh, three months and beyond. Um, and in, in some rare cases, yes, we do put the uh, filters uh, long-term um, for those uh, cancer patients with a poor prognosis and then uh, may not be fit for uh, receiving any um, anticoagulations, all right? So um, uh, this will be performed by the intervention radiologist. So um, this is uh, another summary, uh, which I have uh, mentioned. Um, so you just uh, think about whether the patient is stable or not. Um, if stable, uh, yes, you go into uh, this uh, uh, flow. If not stable, yes, uh, just uh, go ahead with uh, advanced therapy, aggressive therapy, all right? If not, uh, you can just uh, monitor the patients uh, in a, uh, a closed uh, monitoring system, okay? So um, as I mentioned it here, uh, nowadays, um, uh, there are a lot of papers also focusing on uh, the right oral anticoagulations uh, for the cancer patients with PE, um, because uh, uh, previously only uh, heparin is useful and then have benefit, uh, but this is very troublesome because you need to have a person to uh, caregiver to inject um, the daily uh, heparin doses, and um, it, it's not uh, uh, ideal, all right? Um, but bear in mind that only in a GI or urothelial uh, tumor or high uh, risk of the bleeding, then um, you should not use the, the right oral anticoagulations, okay? There will be more and more people will come up uh, regards to the uh, um, uh, using in a cancer with PE. Yes, um, what, what about this uh, special uh, populations of, uh, with the pregnancy, all right? So um, you can use the heparin because during the pregnancy, uh, heparin do not cross the placenta, all right? So this is the safest, safest all right? 
Um, and a multidisciplinary team is um, usually needed in the times of the uh, delivery, all right, um, uh, for having a close monitoring and switching of the um, short durations of uh, anticoagulation. So um, usually have to work with multidisciplinary team, okay, uh, at the time of the delivery. So when we start to give the anticoagulations, right, how long do you need to give? Now it's also back to the, what are the risks that could cause the pulmonary embolisms, all right? Whether there is a transient risk factor or there is no risk factor at all and then um, PE just happened out of nowhere, okay? So um, usually um, you can um, give three months if there is the, the factors uh, that you um, you think it caused the PE, like surgery, uh, immobility, all right? Um, but if there is no causes, uh, you may even give uh, indefinitely. And uh, along along the way, you may have to discuss with the patients what rather um, uh, they want to continue or not, all right? What will happen uh, after patients have a, a PE or the uh, untreated PE, all right? Um, they will have uh, this post pulmonary embolism syndrome because of uh, effect on the cardiopulmonary symptoms, all right? Um, in some patients, uh, it, it um, results into chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. This is a rather um, quite a, a bad outcome as well because in the end, um, cardiothoracic surgeons have to perform surgeries on them to relieve the uh, pulmonary vascular pressures, okay? Uh, high um, pulmonary vascular uh, pressure is in fact um, have a lot of uh, uh, impact on the patient's um, mobility and then uh, quality of the life, all right? But um, usually it will be managed uh, between the chest physicians um, and a cardiology, a cardiologist and then a cardiothoracic surgeons all together, all right? Um, it will also affect the psychological impact in the quality of the life. Uh, most of the patients will be, um, you know, anxious. And uh, most of the time, if they even feel breathless, they may think about whether they have a, a recurrence or not. So um, this is uh, something that uh, we need to consider in those patients who have PE before, we need to have some sympathy towards them as well, all right? And um, that's how it comes to the, the testing and diagnosis of the PE is important in the later stage of the um, this kind of patients, all right? Um, this table is a rather busy uh, table, um, but um, uh, I have uh, summarized everything um, uh, during my presentations is regard uh, to the uh, American uh, hematologists, uh, chest, physicians, chest physicians and European chest physicians uh, opinions, all right? So um, it's rather uh, uh, the same that I have mentioned uh, in my previous slide. Okay, so here comes to the end of my presentations and now back to the cases. Um, so case number one, I'm not sure uh, most of you guys have a correct answer. Um, why I will choose um, a low molecular weight heparin is because a patient have a GI malignancies, usually have a high bleeding risk. So um, heparin would be the better options here, okay? So yes, it has mentioned it, what is the best uh, treatment options here? Okay, so patients have a gastric cancer. Yes, you need to talk to the patients and patients' family uh, regards to the treatment plan in this group, all right? Okay, move on to case number two. So this is uh, um, in acute situations, um, in any settings, so that how are you going to do, all right? Um, I would do uh, ECG and chest X-ray and also a D-dimer mainly because the patients have a tachycardia, even though they, she's young, um, but uh, it's rather atypical. And then um, you, if you put it onto the well score for the diagnosis, it may be about um, 
uh, 1.2. And then uh, if you put into the Geneva score uh, because of tachycardia, maybe about two, yeah, PE unlikely, yes, but I want to um, do a D-dimer to rule out completely, all right? Yeah. For the case number three, um, yes, uh, these patients have done, um, uh, was done uh, the D-dimer when the, he has uh, some acute uh, event things uh, going on, all right? He had a cellulitis uh, because of the RTA, and then um, uh, it was just checked uh, without any pretest probability. All right, and then he came um, to the A and E because he is worried. All right, uh, but based on the um, vitals or the pretest probability, and then PRC score is zero. All right, so there is no indications to trend the D-dimer because if the D-dimer um, uh, fall into the gray zone, you don't know what you need to do next. And then you don't know how you're going to explain to the patients, right? So usually you just need to reassure the patients and give advice, all right? Um, you have to give advice um, in this uh, kind of uh, era, all right? Um, to come back uh, if there's uh, some things uh, um, uh, that, is worrisome or and well, all right, okay. Move on to the case number four. Yes, so this is the case that, um, you know, defaulted. Um, I put it uh, like catching lady because uh, usually they may not be able to follow up uh, uh, for the regular visit. Um, and um, yes, so now it's like a, a sort of like a massive PE, all right. Uh, um, you can see that the vitals are not very stable. And then um, already know that there is a subtle pulmonary embolism, which is um, in your main tract. Okay, so I would choose um, giving uh, uh, fluid resuscitations. Yes, uh, you will have to give anticoagulations and oxygen supplement because the, um, there is a desaturation. All right, then um, you need to admit to the at least to the high dependency unit. All right, please do not ever um, uh, admit uh, this kind of, um, uh, this group of patients to the general ward because the monitoring will be uh, suboptimal. Um, there won't be uh, intra-arterial blood pressure monitoring. Um, all right, so you need to have um, this uh, kind of a, a high uh, cautious uh, uh, to, to, to admit to the high dependency. Of course, the patients don't need to be intubated at this moment. Okay, you need to wait and see, uh, just need to be a little bit patient, okay? Um, number four is wrong because uh, usually we don't give a BiPAP, uh, which is a non-invasive uh, ventilation to the PE, okay? We don't um, uh, give a um, BiPAP to the um, uh, patients uh, uh, with PE, all right? You may even get uh, high flow oxygen, all right? Um, uh, BiPAP usually is more of the uh, uh, cardiac um, uh, uh, pulmonary edema or the COPD, okay? So um, with that, I will uh, conclude my presentations. Um, yes, um, bear in mind that um, it depends on the center to center. Uh, it also depends on the what resource you have. Uh, it is readily easy uh, when we discuss um, uh, during the lectures and then our presentations, but to have a, a high suspicion to pick up PE in a real situation is still a challenge, I would say that. Um, I didn't bring up any of my cases because uh, recently, because of the, some uh, uh, privacy issues um, that we have here. Okay. Um, mm -hmm.